so welcome everyone. This is already session seven. Can't believe we're whizzing through here. And this one, we're going to focus on the Quran. We've done the history, we've done the development. Last week, we had a look at uh, practical everyday things. You know, what does it look like from the ground view, if you like? And we had a little look at the, uh, the Muslim, Muslim landscape around the world and different groupings. And this week, we're going to go back and we're going to focus on the Quran properly and sample bits and pieces and learn about that. So the Quran occupies a very central place in Muslim life that's actually very similar to that of the Torah in Jewish life. Uh, you could say perhaps the Quran is even more the focus of Islam because there is no rest of Tanakh or Talmud or anything like that uh, to take its place. So it's still very much the, um, it's the, the, the document. Um, nothing else comes anywhere near it at all. Uh, there, there are, of course, ma masses and masses of uh, Quran commentaries, and there is the Hadith literature, which is essentially um, oral traditions which eventually got written down, uh, a bit like our Torah Shabel pair, actually. But it all pales in comparison to the Quran. And just to start with some basic facts, the Quran is in Arabic. Uh, but it's not an Arabic that's spoken anymore. It's a very classical, archaic Arabic. A bit think about, you know, biblical Hebrew and the difference between biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew, and you get the idea. And it is 114 chapters long, and each chapter is called a surah. That's the technical term. Uh, it's very close to the Hebrew word surah. So it like surah, it means a shape or a form. And each surah or chapter has a traditional name, a bit like our names for parshas. And it's usually based on an important word that appears in the surah, the first word. Uh, so the 16th surah is called anahal, which means the bee, because a bee is mentioned in it. Uh, the 37th chapter is called asafat, which means those ranged in ranks, which are the first words. Um, number 98 is albayina, the clear sign, which is a phrase that comes up twice in that surah. So again, people very often know them not by the numbers, but by the names. The first one is called Al-Fatiha, the opening, which is pretty self-explanatory, and we'll look at that surah uh, a little bit later. Uh, each surah, each chapter, is divided into verses, and each verse is called an ayah. The plural is ayat, and that's I think, cognate with the word ot. It also means a sign. So each verse is a sign. Uh, some are very, very long. Uh, some verses are two words long, so it depends. Uh, the longest surah, the longest chapter is number two, al-Baqarah, uh, and that is 286 verses long. Some of the short surahs at the end of the Quran are only three verses long, and we'll sample some of them because you can then say you've read several chapters of the, um, of the, uh, of the Quran. Uh, the Quran, Muslims believe, was not revealed all at once. They understand it as having been revealed over a period of 10 years. So it was revealed in different places to Muhammad. And some of the ones that were revealed first, according to tradition, uh, while Muhammad was still in Mecca, are very poetic, poetic. They're in poetic form and they display meter and rhythm. We'll look at that a little bit. And that's an important part of the text's meaning. The more legal and generally the later parts of the Quran are in prose, uh, much, much longer verses. And those are usually thought to have been revealed in Medina after Muhammad and his followers leave Mecca and go to Medina in 622. And copies of the Quran will usually note at the beginning of each surah if they are a Meccan or a Medinan surah, because that's quite important of the um, uh, that's quite important for the context of, of what's uh, of the contents of that surah and whether it was meant to apply only to a particular situation or a local situation and, or whether it's something that's meant to apply for all time. And each chapter starts with the words in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, Bismillah rahman rahim And that statement is known as the Basmala. And uh, most you know, from Muslims will write that at the top of letters or anything they write really, a bit like Bezrat Hashem, uh, very much the same idea. And that uh, starts every single surah of the Quran, except surah nine, where for reasons that I think nobody really knows, it just doesn't appear, really don't know. Uh, in very general terms, the surahs are arran arranged in length, uh, in terms of length. The very first one is only seven verses long. Then you get number two, which is the longest, and then 
it more or less goes in order of size down to the ones at the end, which are maybe three verses long. But it's not absolutely foolproof. Um, they're not absolutely in order. And it's not quite clear what the ordering is. Uh, the Quran doesn't tell stories. It refers to stories that are known, but it doesn't really do much storytelling. So it's not a narrative. And there's no particular obvious order for the chapters. And all sorts of efforts have been made by both traditional Muslim scholars and modern Western scholars trying to see some principle of arrangement of the different surahs. But really, um, it's quite hard to find one. You have to, you know, you have to try very, very hard to come up with a scheme that satisfies exactly why things are in that particular order. So uh, for Muslims, the Quran is literally the word of God revealed by the angel Gabriel to Muhammad over those uh, that period from about 610 to 632, so about 22 years, and for them it is supremely holy. Uh, some Muslim scholars, again, this is by no means the majority, but there is a minority of Muslim scholars who rule that you can only touch a copy of the Quran if you're in a state of purity, and that would mean that non-Muslims cannot touch the Quran, uh, but that is not a mainstream opinion, but that gives you some idea of the regard in which it's held. And Muslims are uh, very like Jews with Tanakh, they're very careful not to put uh, the Quran underneath any other book or to put it on the floor or to throw away copies of Quranic texts. Unlike Jews, however, any copy of the Quran is equally sacred. It doesn't matter if it's printed or written by, ha by hand. For a Muslim, uh, a, even a printed Quran will be just as holy as a sacred Torah is for us. So they don't really distinguish between how they're produced. Uh, unlike us, really, the Muslims have developed the art of calligraphy of the Quran to a very, very high level. And there are all sorts of different calligraphic styles and uh, many of them absolutely beautiful. And many, many Muslim buildings are decorated with uh, Quranic verses. And people sometimes will have a nice bit of calligraphy up on the wall with uh, particular verses in the Quran on, done in very uh, beautiful ways. Um, that's partly also, of course, because uh, there are, there's no use for pictures. Yeah, certainly in um, religious contexts in Islam. Again, that's changed, depends where. Um, but uh, there's, um, so you, what's done instead is using the Quran itself as a decorative feature. And you can see many, many beautiful um, examples of that. And there are all sorts of lovely books on Quranic calligraphy that's just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and they can be found as uh, on buildings, as I say, the decorative plaques. Uh, there, there are medieval garments knitted with bits of the Quran in them. I'm not sure people do that anymore, but certainly there's a lovely pair of medieval socks from Egypt with uh, a bit of Quran knitted around it, rather nice. And uh, yes, there is a concept uh, of a Geniza, definitely. And uh, people don't throw away old damaged uh, Qurans. They just keep them somewhere safe and clean and um, they don't get dumped in the bin by any means. I will remember being at an interfaith uh, gathering once and there were Christians, Jews and Muslims there. And uh, a Muslim and I watched in horror as the Christians were leant over in the middle of the discussion and put their copy of the New Testament on the floor. And the Muslim, and I didn't say anything at all. We just looked at each other in horror and we both knew what we were thinking. So that's, I think Jews and Muslims are very, very much the same in their attitude to their sacred text. And I can treat them with respect. So the Quran was originally an oral text, a recited text, and that's what the word Quran means. It comes from the, well, the equivalent root completely in Hebrew is kuf, resh, alif, mikro, kri'a, uh, which we use for reciting or reading, and it means exactly the same thing in Arabic. And if you think about our term mikra, which is often used to mean that which is written, scripture, the Bible, that's exactly the same root as Quran. So you can see where the name comes from. Uh, it was only later written down, as we'll see in a bit, and it's still very much an oral text for Muslims. Um, as we mentioned in the last session, it forms part of daily prayers. Uh, the first rakah, the first module of prayer, includes the recitation of the first surah of the Quran, of Fatiha, and some other text in the Quran is also, uh, it can vary, is recited during prayers. So everybody knows bits of the Quran off by heart. Um, there's no public reading of the Quran in sequence like we do with the Torah. Um, it's, there's, it's only, it appears as part of prayers, but there are separate Quranic recitations. You can hire a professional 
or if you are yourself a professional, you can have a sort of party really where you read the whole thing and that is still done. Uh, that's still uh, quite a common thing. Uh, people might do it for um, birthdays or celebrations or to mark important life events. It does take about nine hours to recite the whole thing beginning to end, but people don't necessarily stay the whole time. They nip in and out and they're very festive affairs, these uh, public readings. Uh, there are CDs of world famous reciters, a reciter of the Quran is called a Kari. Uh, there are also female Kari's, particularly in Indonesia. And many, many countries have Quran recitation competitions. And they're like, they're really like rock stars, the big Kari's around the world. Uh, are, you know, people, uh, if you go onto YouTube and, and put in Quran recitation, you'll find a thousand. Uh, uh, little YouTubes that say the best ever Quran recitation people put up you know, YouTubes of their favorite parties but people buy CDs they have it on in the background they enjoy it apparently in many Islamic countries Jews used to go along to Quranic recitation too it was like going to a concert and you know even you could be Jewish you could still appreciate a good curry reading so uh, so it was very much part of people's everyday culture and still is depends where you are but it's still uh, very very present in people's lives and um uh, there are two styles of recitation. There's the plain form known as tartil, which is what people mostly use in prayer and uh, in teaching. That's how kids learn. They learn with the, the basic sort of chanting. And then there's a very elaborate and ornamented one called tajweed, and that's what's used in public recitation. And tajweed is an art form. It's a bit like listening to Chazanut. You know, it's got its own rules, and then people, as I say, follow their own particular favorite courage if they're into this and a big deal. Uh, it, it is a huge, huge deal. Um, millions of Muslims, quite literally millions of Muslims, memorize the entire Quran. It is somewhat shorter than the Torah, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's still quite an undertaking. Um, and they'll, they'll memorize that in the simple chant, in the Tartil. Uh, and a lot of people who do that actually can't read or write. So there are a lot of illiterate people who have memorized the entire thing. And many people who memorize the Quran don't actually speak Arabic and don't necessarily understand. Uh, again, it's something they know off by heart, and it has its power all its own. And there are all sorts of uh, folk beliefs that the sound of the Quran is so beautiful that it moves people to tears. And again, if you look on YouTube, you will see 121,000 videos of Christian bursts into tears when listening to the Quran, or you know, Christian immediately, non-Muslim immediately converts to Islam having heard three verses. So it's a sort of folk legend, this idea that it is so beautiful and so wonderful that nobody can resist the sound of it. I have to say I've listened to quite a bit of Quran recitation and have not yet converted and don't feel like doing it. Uh, so uh, um, it's clearly I'm proof, but, but this, this, you'll find that's a very, very popular folk belief that the sound of Quran can, can uh, move people to tears or can impress people who don't even understand what it says. Um, uh, somebody's uh, pointed out that Islam rejected the idea of printing the Quran. I'm not sure if, even if it was a theological thing, um, there was this resistance to printing the Quran uh, for a while. I think the earliest ones are possibly in the 18th century, it's a bit earlier than the 20th, but it didn't come in for quite a while. But that could have been, uh, I've, I've tried to look that up a bit, and it's not quite clear if that was a a religious principle or if it was to do with control of printing presses in absolute monarchies and you know this idea that not everyone can control a printing press because what they're going to do with it is not quite clear. Uh, women can certainly recite a Quran, women uh, and write a Quran, there are no limits whatsoever uh, and um, there's an awful lot of Quran around. Uh, a lot of common phrases in uh, that all Arabic speakers know and that Jew, uh, Arabic speaking Jews as well will use actually come from the Quran, like the very famous Inshallah, which means if God wills it, it's like Im Yatseh Hashem, uh, you know, the Jews from Arab countries will use that perfectly happily, it does actually come out of chapter two of the Quran. Uh, then there's a the phrase Allahu Alam, God knows best which is written at the end of every legal decision. If you ask a Muslim scholar to come out with a, with a fatwa, a, a decision, it's like a psak din. Uh, it's, so they, you know, they're asked a question and they write it. And at the end, they always write this phrase, Allah alam, God knows best. In other words, you know, I've given you my opinion, but ultimate truth lies with God. And then a phrase you might've heard, Alhamdulillah, praise to God, a bit like Baruch Hashem. Uh, that comes in the first chapter of the Quran. So many everyday phrases in Arabic actually do appear in the Quran. 
Interestingly, only about a quarter of the world's Muslims speak Arabic. So that's three quarters of all Muslims do not have Arabic as a native language at all. So hence the fact that not everyone who knows the Quran or, or knows parts of it or can pray uh, or is a from Muslim, they might not necessarily understand Arabic. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily go with the territory. And again, that's pretty parallel with Hebrew. I think a lot of people who govern every day don't necessarily understand everything they're saying. So uh, it's uh, it, those problems of understanding quite, uh, quite parallel. And there are two possible answers. Number one is that all Muslims should learn Arabic. And there have been scholars in the past who thought that was what should be done. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, the 14th century reformer, who we've discussed a couple of times, thought that uh, that was it. It was a religious duty to learn Arabic and people should. Um, it's probably not going to happen. Not with three quarters of the Muslim world not speaking Arabic. Again, uh, you know, uh, that hasn't, hasn't happened in Judaism either. Uh, I would, you know, 50% of Jews today know Hebrew, maybe something like that. I'm not too sure. Uh, the second option is Muslims are going to have to use translations of the Quran. Now, there is a real feeling that the Quran is in Arabic and that's it. And if you put it in another language, it's not the Quran. So there is, again, a, a common understanding that translations of the Quran are not the Quran. Uh, and this is why they're very often not described as translations. So a very, very well-known one, quite an old fashioned one by Pictor, is called The Meaning of the Glorious Quran. It's actually a translation, but he didn't want to write that. And this was, uh, he was uh, an Englishman who, who uh, converted to Islam, I think, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, not sure. And translations for non-Arabic speakers do go back a long, long way. Uh, there are Persian translations in the 10th century. And very often uh, you'll get in older manuscripts, you'll get the Arabic text of the Quran with an interlinear, much smaller translation into whatever the local language was. And if you think of things like, uh, I mean, we have them also interlinear copies of the Tanakh. I think Art Scroll puts one out and uh, Mitsuda puts one out where you have the Hebrew text and then underneath you'll have English words, not necessarily in English grammatical order, but there'll be a word in English underneath, uh, again, slightly smaller. So that sort of thing has been very, very common indeed. But since translations are understood as approximations of the Quran and not the Quran itself, there's no idea about having an official translation. There's no King James or authorized version or anything like that. There are many, many, many translations of the Quran into all sorts of languages, but none of them have any official stamp. That means that when you look at a translation of Quran, because unless you know Arabic, um, you're probably going to read it in translation if you're interested. Uh, you have to be jolly careful. And I've actually, let me actually put the handout up because um, uh, I have put on it a great link to, um, yes, this article, Khalil Mohammed's Assessing English Translations of the Quran. And I've given you the web link there uh, because that goes through all sorts of translations and tells you what principles they're done on. There are politically minded translations. There are Saudi backed translations. And um, we'll have a look at this in a moment also that add in all sorts of stuff that's not in the Quran. So you want to be careful about you know, which translation are you looking at? Don't get one of the bonkers ones. Um, a very widely available and perfectly okay translation is that by MAS Abdul Halim, Oxford University Press uh, published that. You can get it as a paperback. It's possible couple of dollars. Uh, if you really, really want to look at the Quran and understand it, uh, this is where you go. If you're an English speaker, it's called the Study Quran. You see, there's a beautiful, beautiful bit of uh, Quranic um, decoration there below it from a medieval manuscript. Uh, it's very like the Jewish Study Bible, if you've ever seen that. And it's the same format. It's a translation into English with a lot of uh, fabulous commentary, which is based, uh, it sort of summarizes medieval and classical commentary. Uh, and in the back, there's some fabulous essays about the Quran itself, about the translation tradition, about the commentary tradition. So that's really, really good academically based. It is produced by believing Muslims, but it is done in an academic way. And that's a really, really good resource if you want to know more, more about the Quran in detail. I've also put a couple of links up here if you want to hear a bit of traditional uh, Quranic recitation. Uh, this is uh, a link to um, yeah, now deceased but world famous Egyptian Kari called Muhammad Khalil al-Husari, 
uh, and that will give you a very good idea of what it sounds like. And so well, having described what the Quran is like and how it's used, how it appears in Muslim life, we need to move on to how did it come into being? We've mentioned that there's this idea that it's delivered in bits to Muhammad over a period of about 22 years, and that's the traditional view. Uh, and then the traditional view continues with how it got into print. So originally, uh, Muhammad's followers memorized bits of it, not necessarily all of it. Some people did one bit, some people did another bit. Uh, and his followers and his, and his family between them knew the whole thing and sometimes wrote bits of it down. But then after Muhammad's death, it was collected, if you like, it was written down. So this is the traditional account. Again, you can see this is a medieval account of how the Quran comes to be. It's a faith account, it's an internal account. And we'll look at the external one in a moment. At the time of the messenger of God, the Quran was dispersed in the hearts of people, like the memories of people. People wrote some of it on sheets, on palm leaf stalks, on pumice stone, on baked clay, and on other items like that. When the killing of the Quranic reciters intensified one day during the Battle of Al-Yamama, Umar ibn al-Khatib suggested to Abu Bakr, who you might remember was the first caliph, that the Quran should be collected. He feared that the important Quran reciters like Ubay, Zaid, Ibn Masud, and others like them might die. So two of them delegated the task of collection to Zaid ibn Thabit. And Zaid ibn Thabit had been Muhammad's personal scribe. He collected it with great difficulty, without organizing the surahs. In other words, he didn't put them in order. It is reported that in this collection, verses from the end of Surat al Bara'a, that's chapter 9, were omitted until they were found in the possession of Khuzayma ibn Thabit. The sheets, either the written sheets, remained in the possession of Abu Bakr and were translate, uh, transferred to Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, after him. Then Hafsa, his daughter, kept them during the rule of Uthman, the third caliph. It's interesting, again, that a woman is keeping this precious, only complete written copy of the Quran. It's well known that during this time, sheets were also written in distant lands on the authority of the companions of Muhammad, such as the Codex of Ibn Masud, what was written on the authority of the companions in Syria, the Codex of Ubay, and others like them. That is the source of differing opinions about the seven forms, the Ahruf, in which the Quran was revealed. And there are seven very minutely differing textual traditions. Uh, again, the standard Muslim won't even know that, uh, but it, it's real, you know, tiny, tiny, kativkri, minute differences, stuff. Uthman, the third caliph, authorized the collection of the codex and appointed Zaid ibn Thabit to the task of collecting it. And the official story goes on that Uthman then sent out authorized copies to the cities of Kufa and Basra in Iraq and Damascus and Syria. Uh, some versions of the story say he sent copies to Mecca and Yemen and Bahrain too, around about the year 650, and, and then the traditional account says he called in all other copies of the Quran and destroyed them so that there would only be this authorized version and there couldn't be competing versions where maybe people got wrong. And that's the version that's still used today. However, there are some slight problems with that. Um, and we'll look at those in a moment. Uh, it doesn't necessarily hang together. Uh, a debate arose in the eighth century about the Quran between two parties of people who understood it differently. The first group believed that the Quran hadn't been created. It was the eternal word of God. It was sort of part of God. It wasn't a separate thing. And the other group believed, no, God had dictated the Quran at a certain time, and it was a, a time-based document. So one version thinks that the Quran is indistinguishable from God and it's eternal. The other that no, God designed it as a separate thing. And there was a huge uh, feud about this. Um, the it's a created in time thing uh, was promulgated by one of the caliphs, but that later got squashed. So the, by the end of the 10th century, the official doctrine was that the Quran has pre-existed since all eternity and has never. It's an uncreated Quran, um, and it is inimitable. You cannot produce a document like it. And that's also based on a verse in the Quran itself. It says, "Say." If men and jinn banded together to produce the like of this Quran, they would not produce its like, not though they backed one another. So again, that's very much, uh, as, as well as being an official theological belief that the uh, Quran is inimitable, 
Um, it's also folk belief. Uh, all sorts of people have taken up this challenge, uh, quite often Christian missionaries who have sort of produced pretend chapters of the Quran with Christian messages in them and said, there you are, anyone can imitate the Quran. But the official doctrine is that no, no, you can't, you know, the Quran is, is, is inimitable and also that it's uncreated. And that's a little bit like we have uh, traces of that in the Midrash. There are ideas that, that uh, God looks into Torah and creates the world. The idea that Torah is also uncreated and exists eternally with God. Um, I don't know if this came from Muslim influence or if the Muslim idea came from Jewish influence. I honestly don't know which way round that is, but it's interesting that we do, we haven't made a big thing of it. I don't think it's a major point of doctrinal difference, uh, but we do have some of those trends also within our own understanding of, of the Torah. So, um, as a result of this idea that the Quran is uncreated and eternal, coexistent with God or part of God or just, just not a separate thing, uh, that, of course, is why the Arabic form of it is, is the Quran and translations aren't. If you're going to claim it was uncreated and it was always there, uh, though, of course, the, lang the, the language questions comes up, like, you know, pre-existence before they're humans, how can it be created in the human language? But you know, that's another theological problem. But it uh, definitely, definitely does sort of enhance the, the stature of the Quran to assert that it ex has existed since all eternity and that nobody can write anything like it. It's just impossible. Let's turn to modern critical theories. Uh, academic theories of the formation of the Quran. Now within Islam, these are not madly popular, a bit like biblical criticism is not madly popular among the Orthodox, certainly, uh, for many of the same reasons. But, uh, but modern criticism of the Quran does exist and uh, is very interesting indeed. It is a remarkably uniform text uh, from the earliest copies. There are very variations in the vowels, just like in Hebrew, Arabic vowels developed after the consonants, so the earliest copies of the Quran that have survived don't have vowels. Um, we do have some very early manuscripts that were discovered in a sort of Geniza in Sana'a in the Yemen in 1972. Some of those have some of the verses in a different order and they have a few minor textual variants. They're from the seventh and the eighth centuries and they are the earliest copies of the Quran that are known. The very, very earliest written Examples of the Quran are the inscriptions in the Dome of the Rock, one of those we mentioned before. Um, we also need to take account of the, the nature of the Quran. It's quite a difficult book to read. It's more like an anthology you dip in and out, but reading it beginning to end, uh, like you would the Torah, for instance, or a biblical book, is not necessarily what it's meant, meant to do. It's not in narrative order. And another feature that's very clear from the Quran is that it assumes you know stories already, particularly biblical stories. In many cases, it alludes to Abraham or to Moses, and it will just give you one event from a story because it thinks you know those basic stories. So clearly, from an academic point of view, uh, Muhammad was familiar, maybe not with the text of the Torah, but he was familiar with perhaps oral versions of Torah stories and some Christian material as well, because it appears in the Quran. Um, and uh, there are quite a few parallels, uh, both with the Bible and also with early rabbinic material. And here is one of them. This is Quran chapter five, verse 32. On that account, we, that's the royal we for God, ordained for the children of Israel, that if anyone slew a person, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people. And if anyone saved the life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. And that may sound very familiar because yes, here it is in the Talmud Yerushalmi in Sanhedrin. For this reason, the first human being was created alone to teach that whoever destroys a single life is as though he had destroyed an entire universe. And whoever saves a single life is as if he had saved an entire universe. And the parallel there is just far too striking for this to be um, accidental at all. Um, naturally, if you point this out to a Muslim, they'll go, well, you know, of course, uh, God said this early on, and that's how the Jews got it. And of course, it's in the Quran as well. You know, it's all from the same source. Why would you be surprised that there are parallels? Uh, they wouldn't see it as somebody gave some version of that, uh, you know, some, some oral tradition from rabbinic tradition, and Muhammad picked it up and thought, yes, and put it in. You know, that would not be an acceptable or a believable answer for a from Muslim person. But certainly, uh, if, you're, if you're not a from Muslim, you, you can see an awful lot of uh, borrowings or parallels, or, you know, there's quite a lot of academic work on this too.
text. Uh, there are also early citations of the Quran that don't match the standard version that's used now precisely. There are quotations on early coins that don't pre precisely match the version that's around now. Um, and there were rulings made by scholars against using uh, non-Uthmanic versions, non-standardized versions, and those rulings are still around in the 8th century. And that rather suggests that there were some alternative versions still doing the rounds, and that not all alternative versions of the Quran had been destroyed. So all this suggests the text wasn't fixed completely in the early centuries of Islam. And that story about Uthman collecting the Quran is also very, very odd. If you remember, if we net back to it, um, there was already a complete set of sheets kept by Hafsa, the daughter of the second Caliph, Umar ibn al-Khattab. So if she had them all, why did Uthman have to recollect it? That doesn't really add up very much. So why, you know, what's going on there? So the traditional account has got some flaws in it, uh, if you look at it from an academic point of view. So taking all these features and lots of other ones into account, uh, Western, mostly non-Muslim scholars have come up with uh, several theories of the origin and formation of the Quran that are very, very different from traditional Muslim ones and that are accepted by very, very few Muslims. Uh, the scholar here who's particularly important is John Wandsborough, uh, and he wrote two very important works, uh, one called Quranic Studies in 1977 and another one called The Sectarian Milieu in 1978, and they suggest that the Quran was only standardized about two centuries later than Muslim tradition reports in the ninth century CE. And um, I have to say, it's no good trying to read once, but I once tried and he's completely unreadable. Um, even scholars have terrible difficulty with once, but it's impenetrable prose. So I wouldn't try it unless you want to you know, fall asleep very fast. Uh, it's also been suggested that the Quran wasn't composed in Arabia, but in Syria, in the midst of a Christian society with Jewish communities around and that it reflects the theological and religious issues of that time and place. And Wandsworth's books are the basic, but other people have written much easier and more readable accounts. Uh, particularly Michael Cook has written a very good short introduction to the Western theories in his book on the Quran, which I put at the end of this handout. It's uh, one of the very, very short introductions, which is a tiddly thing, excellent book, and that tells you quite a lot more about critical theories of the Quran's formation. So I haven't talked quite a bit about it, we should read some of it. We're going to start with the first surah, um, which, uh, which is Al-Fatiha, and uh, we're going to look at this in some depth, and then we'll look at some others a bit more quickly. It's the first one, it's the one that's recited every day in prayer, so we're going to start there, but we're going to look at this translation of it, and this is from another very, very good book by Michael Sells called Approaching the Quran. Uh, I've got the second edition, which comes with a lovely CD with Quranic recitation of some sample chapters on it, including a woman, which is rather fun. She's very famous uh, in Indonesia, Maria Ufa, and has won all sorts of prizes. So this is Michael Sell's translation, uh, which is very close. We're going to look at the Arabic too in transliteration. This is the whole chapter. In the name of God, the compassionate, the caring, praise be to God, Lord, sustainer of the worlds, the compassionate, the caring, master of the day of reckoning. To you we turn to worship, and to you we turn in time of need. Guide us along the road straight, the road of those to whom you are giving, not those with anger upon them, not those who have lost the way. And I thought we'd look at it a little bit in the Arabic because it is so similar to the Hebrew. I have a very nice Hebrew translation of the Quran by uh, Uri Rubin, a, an academic, and it's quite amazing how, how close it is and how well it fits into Hebrew being a Semitic language. So, Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim. Bismi, Bashem, Ilahi, obviously Allah is very cognate to Eloa, one of our names for God. Irahman, Harrahaman, Irahim, Hamirachim. You can hear how close it is to Hebrew. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Alhamdul doesn't, as far as I know, have a parallel in, in Hebrew, but praise be to God. Rabbi, that's Rav, Master. Alamin, ha olamin, ribon ha olamin, master of the worlds. Again, we have a parallel phrase in Hebrew. Then we repeat it, Rahman, Rahim, the compassionate, the caring. Maliki Yaumadin. Uh, there's a conf the, this is not actually king, though it sounds like Melech. Malik is more a master. Yaum, Yom, Adin, Hadin, master of the day of reckoning. 
Yaka na'abudu, elecha na'avod, to you we turn to worship. Wa'yaka nasta'in, and to you we turn in time of need. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, guide us on the road that is straight. And this word sirat, it's very interesting, or sirat, it's probably from Latin. Uh, the word strata, which has passed into the English as street. It's this is the, it's a rare usage in Arabic. It's not the usual word for a road at all. Uh, and Roman roads, of course, were absolutely straight. So this is probably why it's used because it's the straight road. It's used exclusively in religious contexts. Uh, the normal word for road or way is shari, as in sharia, the way, halakha. Uh, Muslims would not agree that this was a Latin loan word because of course it's the Quran, it's divine. But if, if you're not invested in the, the uh, divine origin of the Quran, it probably is a Latin uh, loan word. Sirat al or amta alayhim, the road of those you have given to whom you've given to them. Ghairim al qudubi alayhim, not those with anger upon them. Wala dali, not those who've gone astray. So this is a word by word translation uh, under the words, which is why it's not quite as flowing. So we'll just go back to his basic uh, translation of the name of God, the compassionate, the caring, praise be to God, Lord, sustainer of the world, the compassionate, the caring, master of the day of reckoning. To you we turn to worship and to you we turn in time of need. Guide us along the road straight, the road of those to whom you are giving, not those with anger upon them, not those who have lost their way. So what are we basic, uh, have basic beliefs here? A compassionate creator, a day of reckoning, the need for guidance in the form of revelation. <laughs> Uh, it starts with God, who's clear there's only one God here, God, obviously God of a cosmic scale, because he's Lord of the worlds. Uh, some commentators interpret this as humans, angels, and divine reality. Uh, we might think he's too distant and far away from us, but no, you can turn to God um, when you need God, when you want to worship God, and God will give you guidance. And there are two kinds of people mentioned in this very brief chapter. Uh, the road of those whom God has blessed, to whom God gives, who are presumably on the straight path, and the road of those who are uh, who anger God in some way, who have lost their way, who are not on the straight path, who have not defined who they are. And it's not clear at all what you have to be doing to be on or off that path. But it's, uh, it's, it's very simple, it's very, pretty straightforward, um, and it's... You know, it's not, I, I would say this is a text that Jews could read going, yeah, nothing particularly weird about that. What I want to show you is two different ways of translating it. And this is as by way of a warning about, be careful about uh, translations of Quran. Uh, here is a very, very, very well-known uh, translator, Abdul Yusuf Ali. You can get his translation all over the place. It's old fashioned. Uh, this is how he does it. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, praise be to Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds, most gracious, most merciful, master of the day of judgment. You do you, we worship in your aid, we seek. Show us the straight way, the way of those on whom you bestowed your grace. You know, in the original, there's no mention of grace. Those whose portion is not wrath and who go not astray. So already here, you can see there are bits that are in there. Uh, also cherisher and sustainer. There's only actually one word there. So it's a more, what you'd call a paraphrastic translation. It's not as precise or not as word for word. Well, now look at what happens when the Saudis do a translation. This, by the way, has been, this is possibly the most available translation because the Saudis uh, sponsor it. So you can get it for free everywhere in the world. And the name of Allah, the beneficent and merciful. All the praises and thanks be to Allah, the Lord of the Alameen, mankind, jinn, and all that exists. The most gracious, gracious, the most merciful, the only owner and the only ruling judge of the day of recompense, i.e. the day of resurrection. You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help for each and everything. Guide us to the straight way, the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace, not the way of those who earned your anger, such as the Jews, nor of those who went astray, such as the Christians. Now, I think you will have noticed that those words are not in the Quran, okay? So this is what you call a tendentious translation. Avoid it like the plague. Um, unfortunately for many, many Muslims who get their Quran only by translation, uh, they may not be conscious that these words are not in the Quran. So just as with Jewish translations of Tanakh, 
watch out and research which translation you use because you may not be getting, if you're looking at the Quran, you may not be getting what the Quran says, you may be getting what somebody says the Quran says. And this is why you have to be very, very careful indeed about translations. Um, so yes, you know, I'd, I'd go for a, not for the side of that. Let's sample a couple of the other short Meccan surahs from the end of the uh, Quran. Again, I've used Michael Sells because he is a very word for word translator. And I thought you need to see that. So this is a complete surah. This is number 107, Al-Ma'un, the small kindness or maybe the neighborly needs. In the name of God, the compassionate, the caring. Do you see him who calls the reckoning a lie? That will be the day of reckoning, i.e. the final judgment. He is the one who casts the orphan away, who fails to urge the feeding of one in need. Cursed are those who perform the prayer unmindful of how they pray, who make of themselves a display, but hold back the small kindness. So again, you get something of the poetic nature here. Again, uh, this is quite deliberate that he's made pray and display rhyme because parts of the Quran uh, do actually rhyme. Uh, it is poetic in form as well as in tone. Uh, and again, you can see the interest here is very much, um, it's a moral message. Uh, those who, rec who reject God's uh, warning of a day of reckoning forever and day of judgment are the people who are unkind to others, the people who are immoral, who treat orphans badly, who don't look after people who are in need, uh, who are displaying themselves but are hypocritical because they don't mean what they say. And this, I would say, is an example of the very common theme in the Quran about the day of judgment and the last day and the reckoning. That comes up again and again and again. We saw a little bit of it last time as well, a description of the day of judgment, but it's constantly referred to throughout the Quran. It's very present uh, in, in the sort of religious ethos of, of, um, of Islam, if you like. Uh, Let's look at another, again, very little one. This is number 108, the next chapter, Dal Kauthar, which could mean maybe given fully or abundance. In the name of God, the compassionate, the caring. To you, this is God speaking to humans, we have given fully Al Kauthar. Pray to your Lord and sacrifice. The one who reviles you is the one who is cut, probably cut off. Now, you can probably see that's absolutely incomprehensible unless you have some context. And a lot of the Quran is like that. You need some sort of key into reading it. Uh, who are we talking to here? What is this about? And who's the one reviling who and why and what is cut, etc. Now, what happens in traditional Islam is the uh, commentating tradition comes in here and kicks in here, uh, often by means of hadith, which are cited to contextualize this passage in an instant relating to Muhammad. So it's usually being interpreted as addressed to Muhammad as an individual and that it's revealed to him after his son has died in infancy when Muhammad's enemies were taunting him about his lack of offspring and early biographers of Muhammad uh, record that he believed that al kautha was the name of a river in paradise or possibly a pond that he saw in his heavenly journey. And the glorious waters of Al-Kautha have become quite a popular and, and important symbol in Islam of the waters of life, you could say, that sort of idea. So uh, it's rather mysterious appearance here has been interpreted and understood in a particular way. Uh, whether that's a correct interpretation or whether Al-Kautha just means abundance in the general sense of God had given Muhammad abundant gifts and communicating with them, it's, you know, who knows? Uh, but the surah clearly does indicate that uh, people who are horrible to Muhammad, well, something bad will happen to them. Again, in the traditional context, it's understood as the people who are mocking him for his son dying are the ones who are going to be cut off from God or going to be uh, you know, come to a bad end in some way, shape or form. And this, I would say, is an example of a surah that is really incomprehensible on its own and which you would have to choose either to do major, major research on or look at Islamic commentary for an understanding, certainly how Muslims understand what this means and what it's connected to. And many rather obscure passages of the Quran like this are interpreted by being linked to Muhammad's life and specific incidents and times in them. 
Okay, so let's look at a more theological one. This is number 112. We did look at this very briefly before, we'll come back to it. It's known as al-Ikhlas or al-Tawhid, which means purity or unity. And the name of God, the compassionate, the caring. Say, he is God. One. God forever, and this word samad, we're going to come back to because it's not absolutely clear what it means. Not begetting, unbegotten, and having as an equal none. And when we looked at this before, we said this is quite anti-Christian because of the not begetting and unbegotten. So this is a refutation of the doctrine of the Trinity. And it's interesting that it, there are three descriptions here. Uh, not begetting, not God the Father, unbegotten, not God the Son, and having as an equal man, not God the Holy Spirit either. It's just one God, not turning up, uh, up in three parts. Now, the word samad is a bit enigmatic. The, there is a pre-Islamic poetic tradition from Arabia that can be related to the Quran in some ways in terms of poetic meter and images and so on. And in that pre-Islamic poetry, samad means a person you go to for refuge. So traditional commentators look at this and they point out there are connotations of something that endures, something that's indestructible. Uh, there's a feminine form, samada, which means a rock. So again, you can see that sort of range of ideas of indestructibility, endurance. So it could be translated, God is a rock, or God is my refuge, something like that. And you can interpret this uh, statement in this story in several senses or contexts. In the moral sense, it means you should have no aims or goals or thoughts beyond the one reality that is God. Anything else is association of other powers with God, uh, which is known as shirk in Islam, uh, avodazara in Jewish terms, strange worship. Uh, in the theological sense, this can be understood as saying God is one in himself, that his oneness is unique, the statement that Maimonides also makes actually, um, God doesn't have separate attributes like knowing or hearing or willing. Uh, this is also a big deal in med medieval Jewish philosophy. God is his attributes, so you can't separate God from his characteristics. Um, they are, uh, if, if, if you said that uh, God's knowing was separate from God, then you'd have two powers. You'd have God's knowing as one power and God as another power. So the uh, denial of any separation between God and his attributes in both Jewish and Islamic philosophy is a very, very major point in the Middle Ages. In mystical terms, you can look at this surah and say uh, the unity of God involves not knowing or experiencing or sensing anything but that one God, and that you should be trying to reach the point at which your own existence passes away into the affinity, the infinity which actually is uh, that one God, which is very like the idea of hitbat lut in Hasidism, the idea that you um, annihilate yourself and just are conscious completely of God and there is no you anymore, there's only God whom you're contemplating, uh, which is quite a Sufi idea. So you can see here one very, very short surah can actually have moral, theological, and mystical implications. And the Quran is a very good text because it's not always clear what it's, what it's actually trying to say. That means it's ideal for, um, for commentary and for finding more and more meanings and levels of meaning in it. So uh, very much the way Jewish commentators have treated the Torah, Islamic commentators have looked at the Quran in the same way and really ransacked it down to little tiny, tiny, details uh, and derived huge rich theories from it and I'm just looking at the time I think we've got time to do one more of these short ones then we'll go back to the legal bit so this uh, is another obscure one but again a very poetical one uh, which is why I'm going to look at the transliteration of it uh, it's called Al-Qadr Destiny and this is the whole of it it's 97 they said they get shorter towards the end in the name of God, the compassionate, the caring, we sent it or him, difficult to know which, down on the night of destiny. And what can tell you of the night of destiny? The night of destiny is better than a thousand months. The angels come down, the spirit upon it or her, not clear, by permission of their Lord from every order. Peace it or she is until the rise of dawn. Now, this is text much beloved by mystics. As you can see, it's difficult, it's obscure. We in the Quran almost always refers to God, the royal plural. 
So God sends something down on the night of destiny, which is clearly a special night. The angels come down. A spirit is upon, not clear what, the thing that's been sent down, not clear. By permission of their Lord, that'll be God from every order. What are, is this the angels from every order? It's not clear. And then whatever this thing is, it is peace until the rise of dawn. What does that mean? So let's look at it as a poem, first of all. It starts off with this, Rahmani Rahim. But you can hear some of the poetic qualities. Um, I'm, my Arabic pronunciation is terrible, so I apologize for it, but we'll just try and get an idea. Inna azalnahu fi laylatul qadr wa ma adraka ma laylatul qadr. Laylatul qadri khayr min alfi shahr. Anazzulul ma'ala ikatu wa ruh fiha bi idni rabihim bin kulli amaru. Salam on here, even in my appalling rendition, you can hear there is rhythm, there is meat, there is repetition, there is meter. This is poem, it's not a prose text. So Kadr can mean destiny or power. And again, we need to look outside the Quran itself to have any idea what is going on here. And usually the night of destiny is interpreted as the night when God first gives revelation to the prophet. That is the night of destiny and prophet when the, uh, uh, and power when the Quran begins to be revealed. This is remembered on the festival called Laylat al Qadr, the night of destiny, which is the, in the last 10 days of Ramadan. And it's a night on which Muslims believe that God decides their fate for the coming years, or the Rosh Hashanah version, you could say. Uh, people often, uh, that night, people often stay in the mosque all night long and they often pray or they read the Quran all night. Uh, children often do their very first Ramadan fast on that day too. It seems very special. So this chapter is very much associated with that night, that night in Ramadan. It's very special, very powerful. It was associated with the first revelation of the Quran. And this is the way this is usually interpreted if we go back to the translation. Uh, the phrase about the angels come down, the spirit upon her, the word for upon it or upon her, it's feminine. Uh, fi ha, ha, like in Hebrew is a feminine ending. Uh, but like Hebrew, Arabic is a language without neuters. It has masculine or feminine. So it's very difficult to know what it's referring to. It could be the angels, because uh, many plurals in, in um, Arabic actually take a singular feminine. It could be the night, that's the time of descent of whatever this amazing thing is, or it could be the night as, as a feminine personified receiver of God's spirit. And whatever this female thing is, is it peace the night is to the rise of dawn, peace the angels are to the night of dawn, peace the power of God is to the night to the rise of dawn? Not clear at all. But the mystics have a lot of fun with this. They evolved all sorts of ideas about the mystical nature of revelation, the, the descent of God's spirit on the world on this special night. And it's, uh, it's, it's a very fruitful verse for, for, for Muslim commentary because it's ambiguous, because it's not quite clear what's happening, but because it's poetic, repetitive, and has these beautiful, if vague, images. So in many, many ways, parts of the Quran give rise to Islamic mysticism because of this ambiguity in these vivid but inexplicable images. We're going to nip back to a legal passage and you will see just how different this is. It couldn't be more different. Uh, this is the fourth chapter, Anissa, the women. Uh, different translations is the one from the study Quran. And uh, we don't have to do all of it, but it gives you an idea of Quranic prose. Oh, you who believe, it is not lawful for you to inherit women through coercion. Uh, there was a pre-Islamic custom that when a man died, his sons or other relatives could inherit his wives. So this forbids that custom. Nor to prevent them from marrying again, that you may take away some of what you have given them, unless they commit a flagrant indecency. Apparently the practice also was sometimes to stop widows from marrying again in order to retain their bride price their, or their dowry. You didn't have to give it back, if they never married. So this passage says, don't do that anymore. And consort with them in a kind and honorable way. For if you dislike them, it may be that you dislike a thing in which God has placed much good. 
If you desire to take one wife in place of another, even if you have given to one of them a great sum as a dowry, take back nothing from it. Would you take it by way of calumny and manifest sin? In other words, when you divorce a wife, don't take her dowry away from her. You've given it to her for life. You divorce her, fine. She has to retain her money. And how can you take it back when you have lain with one another and they have made with you a solemn covenant? And marry not those women whom your fathers married, save for what is past. And here's an example of the realism of the Quran. Uh, save for what it past means, okay, those of you who have wives who were married in this way don't need to divorce them. What was done before Muhammad turned up, we're going to draw a veil over that and we're not, not going to disrupt the family relationships from before the Islamic period. So you sometimes get this save for what is past, meaning, okay, people who, who, who are now following Muhammad don't have to change their family uh, relationships. Truly, it was indecent and loathsome, the evil way. Forbidden to you as wives, your mothers, your daughters, your sisters, your father's sisters, your mother's sisters, your brother's daughters, your sister's daughters. Some of this sounds a bit like the Yikra, yeah? Your milk mother's milk sisters. There was again a very ancient uh, Arabian custom of uh, handing babies over to be breastfed by women from other families because it established close ties, almost familial ties. So you would perhaps place your child with a, a prestigious family and then there would always be that link. Uh, and in Islam, uh, if somebody else has, has uh, breastfed a baby, those people can't marry. So milk mothers and milk sisters would be people to whom you are related by this custom of breastfeeding. Who else can't they marry? Uh, the mothers of your wives, the stepdaughters in your care, born of your wives with whom you have consummated marriage. But if you have not consummated the marriage with them, then there is no blame on you. You can marry them. And the wives of your sons who are from your loins and two sisters together, exactly paralleling the Torah, save for what is past. Then there's that little get out clause for people who had these relationships already. Truly God is forgiving, merciful. And very often when you get a long legal passage like this, it will end with names or descriptions of God. Say so God is X and Y as a sort of summary. And that's quite typical of the legal passages of the Quran, quite detailed, um, concerned with practicalities, concerned with who you can and can't marry. Again, as I said, a bit reminiscent of Vayikra, that idea of, um, of, of giving practical rules. That there, are, uh, there are passages like this about uh, prayer, there are passages about inheritance. Um, not all fields of law, but a lot of fields of law are covered in the Quran as well. And this is the foundation of Sharia, of Muslim law, which we're going to look at next week. Okay, so we're more or less out of time. Um, at the end, I've put three very good books if you want to investigate a bit more about the Quran. I'll just end by saying um, that there is a huge, huge commentary tradition in Islam, very like the Jewish one. In fact, there are some academic scholars who think that medieval Jewish commentary started with Karaite commentators and that they took Quranic commentaries as their models. And certainly uh, that might well be true in the Arabic speaking world. Uh, and quite often the, uh, the Quranic commentaries are earlier than our earliest Jewish ones. So some very famous names, uh, at Tabari, who lived in the ninth century, uh, who's the sort of Rashi of Islam, if you like. Uh, there's an influential scholar, historian, and commentator on the Quran, came from Amol, which is a town in northern Iran, and uh, wrote a tafsir, a, a commentary on the Quran. Uh, again, that was 100 years before Rashi. Uh, Ibn Kathir from the 14th century, uh, another very major figure, a lot of people will read Ibn Kathir's uh, commentary, and again, like Jewish commentaries, they're still around, people are still consulting them. And rather like the way that Jewish commentators of the Middle Ages use earlier Midrash and Targum, uh, these medieval commentaries will use Hadith, will, will use the oral traditions that were preserved eventually orally and then written down in big collections, they will use those as material for the commentary, so a lot of medieval commentaries based on hadith. There are also lots and lots and lots of modern commentators. Uh, we mentioned uh, Kutub, who wrote that sort of extremist's handbook called Milestones. He also wrote a very, very famous, um, well-known commentary on the Quran called In the Shade of the Quran. And there are hundreds and thousands of them. So what I'm going to do is nip to the chat and let's see what we've got here. Uh, we did the, in these one, oldest complete and partial copies. Uh, those are the ones from Sana from the uh, 7th, 8th centuries, 8th, 7th, early 8th centuries. 
Um, can we look around? Is there a parallel phenomenon in Islam to arts for translating and commentary? Yes, yes. Uh, there are thousands of websites where you can get a word by word commentary or translation and recitation. They're endless, endless ones. Uh, some of them are, are remarkably like Art Scroll, yes. Um, what role of offshoots like Nation of Islam paid in the spread of the, I have no idea. I, I mean, I know about the, the Nation of Islam exists. I have no idea uh, how many people have read the Quran because of Nation of Islam or, or people like that. Really don't know. Um, highly hypothetical. Okay, the Quran is precisely tri translated into Hebrew or the Torah precisely into Arabic and the divine name adopted from this book to that, etc. What proportion of the Quran core Quran will be identical. Very small, very, very, very small, um, because the, the, all the stories are, are not in the Quran. Just, it'll just say when Joseph was captured, or you know, when Joseph was sold to Egypt and expects you to know. Uh, actually, the Joseph story, there are some details that come from Midrash, but there'd be very small overlap, extremely small overlap. Um, how do they understand those with anger upon them? Well, you know, depends who you ask. Uh, uh, Tabari will have one view, Ibn Kathir will have one view, Zamakshari will have another view, Kutub will have another view, the Saudis have their view, you know, again, um, it's very much like, uh, you know, you, all sorts of people will, will understand it in different ways. Um, Muslims I hang, up, hang around with occasionally would understand it as people who've angered God because they're, they're wicked and evil and horrible to other people. Uh, Surata might be cognate to the uh, Shura, I don't know, I don't know enough etymology of Semitic languages, alas. Um, I'd simply clarify the paraphrase comes from, yes, from medieval commentary, that's true. Uh, it's known to traditional Muslims as part of the education. Some traditional Muslim, it would depend who, I mean, I hang out mostly with British Muslims who are remarkably ignorant about their own holy book, rather like Jews being pretty ignorant about the Torah. Um, they get very surprised actually when, when, when they read Quran quite often, very few of them know Arabic. And uh, so they, they have fairly open minds about what it might or might not mean. Um, so I don't think they would assume that unless they picked up a Saudi translation. I would say, you know, the majority of traditional Muslims around the world probably aren't aware so much of the medieval tradition unless it's formed part of their education. But, you know, a lot of people I know um, are very unaware of that medieval tradition and quite puzzled by what the Quran might or might not mean, which also means they're quite vulnerable to people telling them what the Quran means. Um, you know, I mean, I hope that it's nice people telling them what they think the Quran means, not uh, people who have, uh, you know, like, like the um, Saudi bouncing off some of the medievals. Again, the, the medieval commentaries themselves, as, as we said before, they don't all agree. Uh, the Saudis have done cherry picking. Uh, the Islamic eschatology is more the end of the world. The Judaic idea is that of the day mankind deserves to receive the Messiah to make heaven and earth. Ooh, I don't know, um, because I have to say, we Jews are all over the place on end of the world, the eschatological messianic stuff. And you can come, you know, there are huge debates about when does Tuchiyat and Meitim happen, when does the resurrection happen, does it happen when the Mashiach comes, does it come to the end of the world, what is the end of the world? You know, how long is the Mashiach going to be around? Um, we seem to have done less systematization of I ideas of end of the world, last judgment, and Mashiach than either Christians or Muslims have done. I think Christians and Muslims both have a much stronger idea of what's going to happen, whereas we're a bit, yeah, well, who knows? <laughs> maybe this, maybe that. And you have, back as far as the Talmud, you have um, some scholars saying, uh, nothing will be different when the Mashiach comes. You know, Rambam picked that one up. You know, the only difference when Mashiach comes will be we will not be subject to the rule of nations. Whereas you get other traditions that when Mashiach comes, the course of nature changes and, and you know, dead will rise and all sorts of things will happen. So um, I think that there is a difference here. And I think the difference is that Jews are very vague and have 25 different opinions and we've never really bothered sorting them out, which I personally think is a good thing. Uh, God has rocks or Israel exactly. Uh, the compromise in Israel's separation of things, indeed, yes. Oh, thank you for the, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, would a Hebrew translation end up close to the original most other language? Uh, uh, in some ways, because they're both Semitic languages, so it's like if you translate something from English to French, you're going to get a much better fit than translating English to Chinese. So yes, in that sense, yes. Uh, and having, you know, sort of stumbled through um, where did I get to? I got to lower intermediate Arabic. My Arabic is crap. But uh, uh, having looked at al fatiha which I'm just about to al fatiha and read it in the original and looked at the Hebrew translation, which I specifically bought to see if this was true, I could say, yeah, I could really, really see the roots, you know, corresponding. 
Um, I am sure there are places where Arabic and Hebrew diverge enormously and it doesn't work. But I think my instinct is that you would get a better idea of what the Quran is like if you read a Hebrew translation than if you read an English translation. It work, it, Arabic works on the same root system. So you can see the way that meaning is created by the repetition of roots in noun forms, verb forms, what have you in Hebrew, that is also true um, of Arabic. So in that sort of style of language, uh, they are quite close. And I think they work well translating backwards and forwards. Uh, line will sit with uh, line will sit by the lamb. Um, don't think it says that anywhere in the Quran. Uh, got lovely images of you know the, the, the gardens playing with, with with beautiful trees and wine or what have you and uh, uh, and um, charming charming serving people. Uh, again, very often interpreted metaphorically or allegorically by by uh, some commentators who you ask but if you think of the way in which um if you think uh, of the way in which uh hebrew commentary is diverse doesn't agree and exists side by side that very much was the position i think with the development of much more extremist modernist movements so the ones we looked at like the islamist movements and some of those it's narrowed that range of commentary so nowadays there's a sort of promulgation of it it means this it can only mean that. And that sense of variety, that sense of um, richness and infinite possibilities of interpretation is not very familiar to Muslims today. Like, and in some ways, it's not very familiar to many Jews today. Um, there is a tendency in the Jewish world also to say, well, you know, art school have done it. That's it. That's what the Bible means. Um, so uh, I think in both cultures, uh, that breadth of interpretation of the Middle Ages has suffered you could say in the modern period people aren't as aware of the multiplicity of, of, of interpretation okay um that looks like it on the chat anyone got a burning question they want to ask in in person i'll stop the share then we can see uh 70 virgins fit in oh i think about the 70 there are definitely um beautiful companions in the garden some of them are male actually um and some are female, and this is where commentary, uh, you know, some commentary thesis will say it's a metaphor. You know, don't don't think there are going to, there's no sex in the afterlife. And other people go, no, it's literal uh, sex in the afterlife. Uh, the problem with satanic verses, oh yes, um, there are traditions in Islam that there were verses in which Muhammad compromised on monotheism and addressed some verses to pre-Islamic goddesses, and that they were removed. In the original Quran, but that's it. Rush didn't make that up. Those traditions are around, uh, and so he wrote a novel with those banished verses featuring it. Um, I've never actually got through the whole thing. I started it and I got bored. I'm really sorry. I probably should try it again. Um, and that was the problem. The problem was asserting that Muhammad might have tried to make a compromise with idolatrous pre-Islamic religion by including mention of goddesses, uh, which would be anathema in today's uh, in today's much more fundamentalist um, outlook. So that was the problem. Um, in, Bringing, bringing Muhammad into disrepute. Uh, the Hebrew translation of the Quran, I would recommend is one by Uri Rubin. I actually don't, that's the only one I know about. Uh, I don't know if there are any others, but he is a, uh, an academic in Islamic studies in Hebrew University, I think. Uh, and I think that's the standard translation. There was an earlier one, I know, but I think that's the standard translation that's been used now. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you more about the satanic verses, but it was then, um, it was this idea that, uh, yes, um, this, 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 these sort of you know, unacceptable verses that were inspired by Satan and referred to goddesses, uh, which sort of brushed under the carpet that tradition a little bit. Uh, you could say a little bit parallel to some of the weird things in Brashid about um, the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. Like, what's all that about? I don't know. And there's some pretty odd interpretations of those too that we, we don't really wave around or adhere to in mainstream Judaism. But uh, somebody could write something about them that would be. Um, that might be as controversial, certainly in in Haredi circles, as Satanic verses was in much wider than Haredi circles. It really um, it did offend a lot of people. Again, I, it's uh, we don't think about Moshe in the same way that Muslims think about Muhammad. Um, Muslims feel a very very warm and personal love for Muhammad. Um, he is the perfect man. He is this beloved, beloved figure, and they strive to be like him in a way that, what Jude tries to be like Moshe, 
Hmm, not really. So um, things that seem insulting to Muhammad are personally hurtful to Muslims in a way that if somebody made a rude joke about Moshe, I don't think most of us would get terribly upset. We might just go, oh, it's not somebody you want to hang out with. Um, but it, it was much more hurtful to Muslims of, of all strands. Okay, are we there? I think we're there. Yes. Uh, uh, just one more question in the chat. Yes. Um, yeah, which is, I guess, uh, Sivan is just asking about um, the satanic versus oh, more exactly satanic. called satanic. I have a feeling, and again, I can't remember exactly, but I think these iffy verses that Muhammad was almost persuaded into accepted, I think the idea is that Satan presented them to him. I said, why don't you put these in? Then everyone will be on your side. Just put in the, you know, the, the reference to Allah and the other goddesses. There was a goddess called Alat, which is a female form of Allah. Um, a couple of other ones, I can't remember their names. Uh, and I think the, the original story is that Satan suggests those verses to Muhammad and he sort of wavers, so they're satanic verses. Uh, that's if I remembered it correctly. You might want to go back to the satanic verses and read it and find out exactly what it is. My memory is not 100% on that one. Okay, and next week we're going to look at Islamic law, where it comes from, what it's like, um, and consider that. So see you all next week, I hope. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye.